as you can see here, the way the cottages, the ones that are left, are uh, sitting where they are. And uh, when that uh, lake rose on December the 2nd, 1985, and we're talking about water coming up this high, it virtually picked the cottages up and put some of them over into the marsh. And uh, you can imagine the force that comes in from that lake when we do have such storms as that. And uh, we're, we get these storms one or two a year and uh, maybe more if we're uh, not lucky enough to uh, avoid them. And uh, it's not only the loss that we have along the beach, it's tourism, it's the marshlands, it's the spawning grounds for our smallmouth bass in the area, and uh, farmland and everything that's along the lakeshore is certainly uh, hurt by this, uh, these big storms. Uh, emotionally, people are uprooted. Uh, uh, you know, the cottage is gone, uh, their asset is gone, their business is gone, uh, and there's no alternative. Some people's lives have been totally devastated. Uh, they had insurance and went after the storm was over. When they went to collect on their insurance, they found that uh, their insurance policy exempted the type of damage they ha had done to their cottage. Uh, it exempted wind-driven water. And trying to, to decide what part was wind and what part was water, um, a lot of the insurance companies said simply, no, nothing. There are two theories about the levels of the Great Lake. One of them is that the rainfall has increased gradually over the last several years, and that's caused too much volume of water. Uh, the other theory, of course, is that man, with its St. Lawrence Seaway and its shipping, has, uh, through lack of water management, created bottlenecks and volumes of water that haven't moved where they should have. Uh, it's probably a combination of both. I think people do have a right to be a little bit uh, suspicious. Uh, man has interfered with the Great Lakes system in many ways. Uh, there are some very obvious ones, uh, diversions, uh, dredging, uh, channel improvements, navigation structures, uh, that kind of thing. The result of the diversions that we have is that we now add additional water to Lake Superior since the early 1940s. Mm -hmm. However, the amount of additional water relative to the things that we, we do or could do, in my opinion, is insignificant. Um, the water that we divert, for instance, on a Golki, comes through Lake Nipigon, through our plants on the Nipigon River, and on an annual basis, that clean, cheap power is worth $20 million to the people of this province. Well, many people around the Great Lakes feel that because we do have the power to change the flow of rivers, such as water which would flow into Hudson Bay, and now we bring it down into Lake Superior, that we have a lot of control over the lake levels with diversions. But in reality, our control is very small. The impact of diversions on lake levels can be measured in terms of inches, while on Lake Huron alone over the last 20 years or so, we've had a range in levels of over five foot due to natural causes. I'm convinced that nature is still the dominant force here, that, uh, that the reason why we have these uh, periods of, uh, of uh, what appear to be excessively high lake levels uh, can be attributed primarily to long-term changes in precipitation and evaporation. Well, precipitation is certainly one of the important climatic variables that affect lake levels. But the precipitation in one particular area may not be indicative of the precipitation, the rain or snow, over the whole watershed. These lakes are huge, and the watersheds are almost twice as large as the lakes themselves. So we must look at the precipitation over the whole uh, watershed. In addition to the precipitation on the lake surface, the two other factors that are important are evaporation from the lake surface, the evaporation depends on the temperature of the water, temperature of the air, the humidity of the air, and can remove large amounts of water from the lake surface. Lake Erie, for example, the uh, evaporation could amount to 30 inches in an average year, while the precipitation would add about 34 inches. But the third factor, which is perhaps not so well known, is also the runoff from the land area of the basin. Rain and snow also fall on the land, and the part that doesn't evaporate runs off in the rivers into the lake, 
And for Lake Erie, uh, this amounts in an average year to 28 inches for the year. If you add all these factors together for an individual year or an individual month, you can see the contribution of that particular lake and its basin to the overall Great Lakes system. The people tell us that it's rainfall, but yet from this aspect, from where we're sitting here on Mantoul Island, it, it doesn't appear to be rainfall. It, it's quite normal here, and, and yet the lakes seem to go up, so we wonder if it isn't something else that's causing it. Well, of course, the average is what you never get. Average precipitation is um, based on long periods of record, but if you look at individual years, there's tremendous variability. During the 1930s, we had a period of very low precip. During the last 15 years, we've been in a period of high, bunched together for no uh, known reason. The same is true of evaporation and runoff. They all vary from year to year. So by putting all of these parameters together, we get some idea of uh, the contribution of a particular lake and its basin to the overall Great Lakes system. And during the 60s, this contribution was very low and lake levels fell. Right now, during the 70s and 80s, the contribution of the basin is very high and the lake levels are high. Part of their frustration is that they, they believe that uh, shipping, hydro, etc., are being considered uh, over and above the effect on the lake shore, that the high water levels benefit industry. And whether that is true or not true, I don't know. But I do know that that question has to be asked and it has to be answered and it has to be answered honestly. At one time way back I remember my father was alive the, the lakes went way down and they said at that time it was the Chicago drainage canal they just built it and it was draining all the water out of the Great Lakes and we were soon going to be high and dry and of course that didn't happen over the years the water came back up. We wonder now if somebody isn't trying to hold it up to get a better head and we wonder if it might be Ontario Hydro at Niagara Falls. The falls is there if the water is higher it's, it seems that it should be able to run over the falls faster and get rid of more of it but yet it, it's, it's not, so we wonder if they're trying to generate more electricity at Niagara Falls and, and therefore trying to get a bigger head of water to do it with. We do in fact have a, a it's a control structure, it's not a, a dam as such, there are gates and we move them up and down. We do in fact operate that jointly with the New York Power Authority um, under the instructions of the International Joint Commission. The, some of the problem that people may have perceptually is that the fact we call it a control structure it in fact isn't controlling the flows on the Niagara River. All it's doing is controlling the amount of water that is diverted to our power stations. It in, it in fact extends only halfway across the Niagara River. So the remaining flow goes straight over the American and Niagara Falls. We don't control that. We don't control the total flow down the river. And in fact, some people also think that that because we have a structure and we close gates, that, that the water level then is so high. And, and in fact, what happens is the structure's here at this sort of level, and Lake Erie is at this level. And the, the, the thing that controls the outflow of lake water from Lake Erie is a ridge of rock across the mouth of the Niagara River. And that is the main factor in determining how much water flows out of Lake Erie, not this structure down here. We operate to general parameters that are set by the seaway. For example, in the Welland Canal, the locks were built in the 1930s. They were built to a depth, of, an operating depth of 26 feet, uh, a length restriction of 700 feet, a width restriction of 76 feet. All the ships that are in the Canadian system have been built to those parameters for many years. So that is the, the general system that we have and we can't take advantage of an increase in any of those dimensions such as water depth because the operating limits have been set and have been established for a long period of time. I have some ambivalence about what the causes are. I've talked with a number of people in the Port Dover area particularly and um, hearing of such things as the deforestation, uh, drainage, uh, the various diversions and I am having a great uh, difficulty coming to terms of, as to what the causes are although I suppose at this time I'm leaning toward the fact that there is human interference. I've also considered the weather aspect and, and uh, feel that that plays a part, but probably our interference plays a greater part in 
I'm at the stage where I'm thinking that we can do something about lowering the lakes, and I guess I'm seeing 25N as a possible project. A lot of people are looking for some scheme or a regulation uh, plan that will help lower the levels of the lakes. The International Joint Commission did a study back in the late 70s to look at several different variations. One of these, which is the most popular and quoted a lot, is Plan 25N. 25N really impacts Lake Erie primarily by dredging through and blasting a rock sill in the upper Niagara River that really controls the level of Lake Erie and also, to a smaller extent, the, the other upstream lakes. And by blasting a channel through that sill, we would increase the capacity of the Niagara River to flow water out. And to compensate for this, the plan would call for putting in some gated structures so that during low lake levels, you could shut the gates and hold the water back. High lake levels, you'd raise the gates and increase the flow. Now, what makes this plan appealing to a lot of people is that during the current high lake levels, if the plan had been in operation, we could lower Lake Erie by approximately one foot and Lake Huron by about four-tenths of a foot. That's assuming that the plan had been in operation. From the time the plan would be started, actually the channel blasted and everything put into place, it would take us probably about three to four years before we could get about seven-tenths or eight-tenths of a foot effect on Lake Erie. It's not an instantaneous thing, and it would really take about 12 to 15 years before we could get the full effect of such a plan as 25N on the upper lakes as well. So there's really not a lot that we can do that will instantaneously lower the Great Lakes. There is no plug. I don't believe there is a simple solution to the problem of high water on the Great Lakes. It is true that we can put into place a plan such as 25N that will have a modest beneficial impact on shore property interests. But we are limited in our ability to regulate or control the Great Lakes and we must recognize that uh, we will continue to suffer problems of uh, recession, long-term uh, erosion in portions of the, uh, of the Great Lakes shore. Uh, we'll continue to have localized uh, flooding problems, particularly during uh, strong storm conditions. These problems will not be totally eliminated by any plan of regulation. I mean, the levels of Lake Erie have been up and down eh, ever since the white man's seen them, and I'm sure that they will continue to go up and down. Uh, and it's, I think the real problem for us is to decide how we're going to live with it. And if there is some way that we can economically control that, that's fine, but how do we live with Mother Nature? It's back to the old question that man has had for many years, isn't it? <laughs> it don't get along with us, we gotta get along with it. I think the conclusion then is that we must start to focus some attention to coping with these fluctuating lake levels, to accommodate nature to a greater degree than we have in the past. I guess what I'm suggesting is that we need to give the issue of shoreline management the attention it deserves.